Mother was sitting in the pew closest to her right as Katerina entered the church. The nursemaid wore one of Lady Eleanor's dresses and carried a whimpering bundle. The sun was crying tears of sadness through the shattered window panes and the echo of the sea's waves slipped in as a late guest. As the maid walked down the aisle, she kept her eyes on the sitting woman, not daring to look at the bleeding cross and cursed her mother with every step she took. You sold me, witch. I'll never call you mother again. Her hands were bound with barbed ivy, their teeth gnawing at her wrists and leaving crimson burns, and they looped around the entirety of her hands, forcing Katerina to clutch a dying bouquet of snowdrops, their icy heads melting away. The wedding dress she wore began its tight chain around her throat, a ruffle which blossomed outwards until withering at the ends, spinning the elevated white into darkness at the bottom and trailing dejectedly behind her in a train of misery. The fabric, weeping tears which threatened to pull her down and ravage the malleable legs, holding her down. One of the water-stained slippers she wore stuck its tongue through the rip, and for a moment Katerina wavered. Then something pulled her upright, forcing the foot to become the victor, and the hungry gaping mouth to tear a little more. The rip roared in the silence, and the maid closed her eyes momentarily. When she looked back, she saw a scruffy wolf, dog, Burris, wiry and sporting two pairs of lacy stockings, holding her train delicately in his powerful jaw and bloodied teeth. Her ankle ached at the memory of the unbroken hooks digging into the flesh, dragging her from the safety of the sea an hour earlier, pulling her towards the chapel. Perhaps he was asking for forgiveness. A soft, Fluffy warmth brushed her lower leg and she glanced down. Isabella's dog. He scuttled beside her. He was dressed to be her partner in this ordeal. A similar black and white dress that was designed for a smaller body had been put on him. A string of roses were tied to his tail and with each mournful wag one of them dropped to the floor. They shed a look and in those milky brown eyes there was pity. Finally, she stared forwards. Frederick stood before the cross, facing it, and a tremor of fear passed through her. She knew nothing about this man, whether or not he was violent or kind, cruel or misguided. Please, don't hurt me. Katerina was almost at his side, and now she had reached his guests. Goderick was in the place of a vicar, while Isabella and a favourite of her maid sat in a pew, cooing over how adorable her fairy children looked, while a scattering of Angela's servants watched from the back pews with her traitorous mother, who had offered up her daughter for protection of the mother. She stopped, and Frederick reached out for her hair, washed only by the sea after her imprisonment and ignored her flinch. Catherine, Goderick began. Frederick glared at him. Katerina, the younger man coughed out. The other man shrugged his shoulders. Katerina, you are about to be brought into the Angelus Nocturnal family, which will grant you safety on Helvergate to be my son's wife. She did not meet his eyes and instead stared down at the bouquet, for if she looked at him, then she would also see the cross and the body they had left there. I don't want this, Katerina whispered. No one responded to her, and the only reaction she got was the slight, sad downturn of Frederick's lips. Goderick was picking up the two goblets and knife by his feet. With the joining of the blood, your souls will mesh, and you shall both be man and woman, both Frederick and Katerina, from within. Frederick held out his arm and did not cry out when the blade sliced him. A red mouth appeared, which drooled out blood and spat into one of the cups. 
Katerina's arm was slowly, almost gently brought up by the Angelus leader, and the tip of the knife wavered. For her trembling skin, it went in, though not as deep as Frederick's wound had evolved into, and two red-rimmed eyes blinked from the cuts, crying out a few teardrops into the silver goblet until they fell asleep, healed and congealed. The cups were switched from their positions and given to their respective drinkers. Frederick drank deeply even though there were only a few drops, while Katerina sipped distastefully at her river. She glared at her husband, wished he would die in that very moment, and sucked in another mouthful of thick blood she intended to spit it at him. A hand slapped her back, causing Katerina to splutter and swallow it down. Her coughs coincided with Goderick's speech, his arm snaking back to his side. You are now Katerina Angelus. You shall no longer be called Maid or Khan. That family is dead to you forevermore. When her gasps had died down, aided by Frederick's coaxing and a worried palm rubbing her back, she saw the Angelus servant stand. Isabella herself arose with a pair of scissors and went to the bouquet, snipping it free. Throw them, girl, she commanded. Then you can leave this church. Katerina looked at her with confusion, but threw them, limply, barely noticing where they landed. A baby cried. The mass of dying snow had landed at mother's feet, and the crone swooped down to tuck it into her pocket, a souvenir for the trading of Katerina. The servants inched closer, and Isabella picked up where her husband had left off from. And now, the gift of gaining life and understanding death, Katerina. You are now gifted with the mark of Nocturnal, and so the vision of death must remain from within to remind you of this. Begin. She clapped her hands once, and the servants lunged, pulling and tearing at Katerina's mother, who shrieked and tried to thrust forward the crying bundle that she had given birth, give life to, so that they went for baby Emily instead of her. They pushed aside her outstretched arms and clawed, Another cry mingled with the newborn's wail. With harsh, desperate movements, Katerina ripped at the ivy and wrenched most of it away. She covered her ears and ran into the crowd, using her whole body to push through the much stronger men and women, searching for her little sister. She made one arm fall down to twist and reach for the dirty linen Emily had been swaddled in and found nothing. Someone forcefully dragged her back and she cried out, begging them to let her back in, or to save the screaming baby. They could have her mother. Frederick was holding the back of her dress, stopping her from going back in, and she watched as he let go and took her place, easily sliding into the mess of scratching limbs. Isabella was now holding her still, gripping her wrists painfully, and it was only when the servants dispersed that Katerina saw what had happened to her sister and mother. Blood grew from the pews, a shawl hung tattered and lifeless from one. While an adult body lay twitching on the floor, she didn't look in her mother's painted eyes. All she could focus on was how the once healthy arms had withered into husked roots and had almost melted into a wax-like substance. Frederick stood a small distance away, cradling a bundle of cloth, and there was no noise. His hand covered where the face should be, and a stain dripped from it. His eyes were downcast. I'm sorry, Katerina. Her scream ripped into the cruel air, burst the stained glass windows, and sent shatters of agony. Thank <laughs> you.